Thank you, Abigail, and thank you to everyone. And what an amazing performance. I feel like uh, whatever happens tonight could be incorporated in a future performance. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> well, it reminds me of a great Canadian um, poet, um, David Bromage, who gave a, um, an amazing performance about um, podium behavior, um, in which he just sort of analyzed what we do up here. Um, and it was a chef d'oeuvre. Um, je veux dire uh, merci à Abigail et à tout le monde qui a uh, helped bring me here. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to read um, a couple of poems that Abigail translated. Thanks, thank you to you, Ab Abigail. And then, um, um, then I'll read some new work, and then I'll finish with another poem that she translated. And I apologize for being a minute late. We were lost in the Chatelet Metro, <laughs> wandering around, <laughs> trying to figure out where we were. Okay, but it's wonderful to be here and in this space and to read in Double Change, which I've admired for years. Okay, 816. So I'm going to start with the follow through mm -hmm. and the thresh, arrow threshold, and then I'll read some of them. Okay. okay. So I'm going to start with a poem called The Follow Through, which um, Abigail very kindly translated for me, and I'll read the entire thing, and then step aside and she can read that. Uh, the follow-through. Freud said that interruptus in coitus, too often practiced, can lead to madness. <laughs> People agree with Freud, obviously. Nor does muse brought ecstasy once begun, though different in kind, abide frustration. The repressed line break, the uncoupled rhyme, come back as madness in the poet's mind. La continuation. Freud dit que l'interruptus dans le coitus, pratiqué trop souvent, peut conduire à la folie. Et l'extase accordée par la muse, une fois entamée, bien que différente de nature, n'admet pas plus la frustration. L'enjambement réprimé, la rime esselée, reviennent sous forme de folie dans l'esprit du poète. This next one is called the Eros Threshold, coming and going. And um, I'm going from the Eros Threshold. Um, which is very much like coming into the arrow's threshold, which is like being a teenager again. <laughs> Some people remember. I'd forgotten, and now I'm remembering. Uh, the arrow's threshold, coming and going. And when Abigail chose to translate this one, she said she chose it because it had a Rodeferian title, a title like a poem by Stephen Rodefer, who was one of my teachers and who she's the translator of, and so I was very, very happy that she, she saw that. Okay, the arrow's threshold coming and going. Spiritus mundanos, a midnight mist veil, unwicked droplets creep, ignite, crackle, the length of this weighty cavern, a million subcutaneous pulsars, spark turn inside the membrane, redraw the clock, hang it anew in the expansive no place of atemporal syntax. There is no place like home. I lost from my ear the seven strings in questing too long for the mother's kiss. It's not, I thought, the one and the many, but earthly memory and even a trick. Now I turn and find in your kiss the true vectors of wares unasked for. I make the pass, enthralled by arrows exiting, just as when entering I was moon blind and night seeking over gravelly pavements and grass, each other tastes unlike each other. Outside the station wagon, muffled voices, smell of weed, hard flesh, through matter to no matter to ever and where. Le 
Seuil des Roses, aller et retour. Spiritus Mondanos, voile de brume à minuit. Gouttelette non mouchée s'insinue, sans flamme, crépite, tout le long de cette caverne pesante. Un million de pulsars sous-cutanés font des étincelles sous la membrane, redessinent leur loge, la replacent dans le vaste nul nulle part de la syntaxe atemporelle. Rien ne vaut son chez-soi. J'ai perdu par l'oreille les sept cordes dans ma quête trop longue du baiser maternel. Ce n'est pas, pensais-je, l'un dans le multiple, mais la mémoire terrestre et même un truc. Maintenant je me tourne et trouve dans ton baiser le véritable vecteur des lieux non sollicités. Je fais la passe enchantée par Eros qui sort juste comme en entrant j'étais aveuglée par la lune et à la recherche de la nuit sur le trottoir graveleux et l'herbe. L'un l'autre dont le goût diffère de l'un l'autre. À l'extérieur du break, voix étouffée, odeur d'herbe, chair dure, par la matière jusqu'à son absence, à jamais et où. Thank you, Abigail. So now I'm going to read a few poems from my new manuscript. <coughs> And I have a series of poems. The new manuscript is called Druthers. And I was trying to figure out how you would translate that into French, and I can't figure it out. It's an American colloquialism, which means I would rather um, druthers. So, druthers. I would rather run a butter knife through Ruskin's uncut pages than under the, than under the lip of a stuck tack. I would rather come under a hand that, that's apt to undo me than be buttonholed by a walking dictionary. The next one is... <laughs> I think for me um, this, next, this next poem, the painter Alex Katz um, did a series of uh, prints based on a song You Smile and the Angels Sing. I, I, I'm not sure if that's the entire title, but he asked some poets to write poems based on that. So this is a poem in response to that song. And the angels sing, the burden of heaven grips me in your bite. It's not right, but what can I do? Your grin plucks such unthinkable melodies into being. My eardrum can hardly take it. Tunes that build sandcastle beauties in my conch straight out of architectural digest. I can't afford it, the angelic judgment of your distracting smile. Without being thrown out on my heel, dazed by trumpet-playing ninnies in unisex robes who blow on cue like Xavier Kuga in You Were Never Lovelier. I'm lost, one glint off the white of your incisors and I'm whisked inside the celestial philharmonic, deaf to all necessities of this mortal slip. Do you remember Xavier Kuga? Yes. And his orchestra, I know you remember, Josh. <laughs> I was like, Charles will get that reference. <laughs> Um, now you can Google everything, right? So one need not worry about one's references. Uh, this is a variation on a poem by Robert Herrick, who, um, as you know, is a 17th century British poet. Um, variation on a poem by Herrick. Love, I have broke thy yoke. What was clear-eyed upon the plate is naught but dismal smear. My failed attempt to spear my love and oust the ache instead outspread, and now I'm toast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know that there are a lot of translators in this audience, um, and I know that translation is really one of the most unrewarded and yet rewarding <laughs> things one can do. Um, so this is a poem for St. Jerome, who, as we all know, is the patron saint of translators. And um, I've always remarked that in all the paintings of Jerome, you know, he has his lion with him. But the lion does not look like a lion in many of the paintings, but looks like a dog with like a lion mask on, you know? Because <laughs> one had the feeling that many of the medieval painters had never seen a lion. 
And so this is uh, about St. Jerome and about translation. And what I learned in um, reading about St. Jerome is that, you know, in the paintings, he's also practically naked and in the desert, and he looks like he's suffering. And, but in fact, he had a very great library that he built by pilfering the gold of widows who wanted his advice about how to keep their daughters from having sex. <laughs> so there's a complicated history there. So this is called If a Lion Could Talk. <laughs> it's not funny though, the poem is serious. <laughs> okay. If a lion could talk. It was only the dawn of the Christian movement, but Jerome was already wise to it. He knew that but for a man who is not a man trapped inside books, would latter-day painters lose their perspective somewhere along the vanishing point. So he tied his body to a great denial and scolded his widow patron's daughters for cr the crampy hungers gathering in theirs. Leaving behind his aesthetic theater, he let his rags polish the floors as he delighted in the intercourse of a little night reading. The dog-faced lion played along, shedding the sweaty mane cape, rewarded each night for his loyalty with a bowl of kibble. Jerome gazed out of the casement at a beautiful scene, stars fanning the cool expanse of lapis desert dome, and chuckled to himself. No one paints a saint in a great library built through the pilfer of a pious widow's gold. A scholar, he knew that sainthood, just like good translation, requires a bit of finger pointing and some ethically questionable sleight of hand. The finger pointing was when I realized in translation one of the ugliest things about it is in order to justify trans retranslating something you have to critique the other translator, right? So it kind of builds in this impossibility of a translation alliance, right? Because you're like, this translation is crap, I've got to retranslate this. <laughs> All right, this next poem is for um, Jacqueline Risset, who is the French poet who I've translated two books by and who passed away a couple years ago. Um, and her widow, her widower, Umberto Todini, um, has been working hard to keep her reputation alive and he um, asked for several people to write poems for her and this is for her. It's called Enigma Porter for Jacqueline Musset. Before, aft, I cherche a searcher, her ear as text mirror, elle suit a belle suit, an able suitcase avant, après, the apt threshold, the old trifold, tremble, trésor, chest, porté par l'énigme porteur through the portal of fragmented defenses, défense d'entrée, sleep, illness, memory, mortality, mortalité, mémoire, maladie, sommeil, interdit, interred, interred dream, the instant, the vision, the fluffy white tail of the poem's swift body disappeared, a trace a tracé into Dante's garden, game on je. This is another Druthers. I would rather listen to tercets on blind amour than defenses explaining what poetry's good for. I would rather the poems score my ear in prison than enumerate the wrongs of late capitalism. <laughs> this one's called On the Level. Around 1985, I began to project my future into the 1920s. Free of the corset, newly enfranchised, a girl with a haircut like one of the guys. In the future, I would be the heroine of a Vera Caspery mystery, listless in my studio apartment, littered with stockings and cocktail shakers. I could just see myself balancing cozily on the pinstriped knee of my sugar daddy while he sweated out multiple gin martinis. <laughs> Gee, doll, you're swell. He winks at me, and though I'm not actually very pretty, he pulls my head back with a handful of platinum and plants one on the collar damned if I know why he gets to me. In the years to come, there would be other pasts, 
But in 85, it seemed to me that the 1920s had all I could ask for. A new woman bohemia before hippies or yuppies, then called babbits, whom everyone laughed at. I wanted gold-tipped cigarettes and Chanel number no. five. There weren't any cell phones in my future, but just down the hall from my apartment was a phone for residents only. The faded wallpaper added necessary melancholy, geometric calla lilies, art deco motif. In 1985, I thought the only screens in my future would project moving pictures of silent idols or be hung nonchalantly with peach slips and tap pants, a garter belt or two used to cordon off a dressing room in the corner of my studio. Without these dreams of the 1920s, how could I have pinned my hopes on an adulthood of something besides cash registers and classrooms? My parents, having fled their pasts, had no way to build a future. I had the crackle of jazz age recordings preserved on 1980s vinyl. Listening prepared me for 2015's haunting by technological memory, but not for its presentist static, those super abundant incremental distractions not on the level with any future or past. I wanted to say, Allison asked me to say something about re my relationship to recorded poetry, and you know, if I had been on time and we had been able to set up, I was going to play a file from 1993 of a reading I gave at the Ear Inn in New York, which I'm sure Charles was responsible for recording. And this was 20, what, 20, how long ago is that, 93, 23, 20, a long time ago. And um, the, one of the major differences in my life as a poet with recorded poetry is that recording was made in 1993 in a bar. It's very staticky, but I didn't hear it until maybe 2010 when it showed up on Penn Sound, much to my horror. <laughs> For, you know, because my students would be reading, listening to that. Anyway, we're now, and so you suddenly have this, this artifact from your past presented to everybody. Where now, I go to give a reading, and before I'm home on the plane, it is on the internet. So there is no time between performance and dissemination of that public event, often is the case unless you sign a thing saying, I need to preview this before. And then you have the horror of that event, of previewing it before. <laughs> so it, it's, it's almost as though, and for me, readings are often, like I'm reading a manuscript now, they're often the place in which I do a lot of revision, because I read the work and I make changes as I read. So it is a process of revision, and when I revisited the 1993 recording, which was mostly poems, from this book, which didn't come out until 1996, which was my first book, right, so this is Juvenilia, the poems in here do not match the reading exactly. So it's really a draft that's out there. And so that has really been a big change now, this instantaneous publication of everything, much more before you have a book publication, right? So everybody has, you've published all of your work before it comes out in print in audio form, is my experience. Okay, I just have a couple more. I have this one called The Spark, which is the last of the new poems, and then I'm gonna ask Abigail, Abigail to come up and read her translation of um, a poem in my last book, The Open Secret, and then I'll read the English to finish. Okay, this is called The Spark. I wrote this happiness myself. I chose this man, this house, this cat. I put my shadow twin upstairs in the leaf of a mediocre book I thought never to open again. I felt grateful. Upstairs, there were many photo albums with gluey pages and yellowed mylar, in between which Polaroids had come unstuck. In them, happy children pitch tents, watch TV, open presents, and smile before homemade birthday cakes. Had I known them? I knew that I was not missing them or missing out, and thus my heart was full. But, I thought, should phosphorus mix with potassium chlorate and hit the gaseous air, this man, this house, this cat be lost, what then? They join the many other dead whose memories I tend. I cannot miss. My heart is full and grateful. But I thought, while I still could, 
Should neuroplax and tangles, not my mind, my heart would empty, and all of this would cease to be. I could not miss it, nor even this, my spark. Dividende du retrait social. Quel bonheur de ne pas y aller, de soudain tomber malade, pas gravement malade, juste un peu mal fichu, pas dans son assiette, pas de trac, frappé par un mal indéterminé ou un coup de froid inexplicable. Peut-être ces plaisirs sont-ils refusés à ceux qui ne se sentent jamais obligés, s'ils existent. Quel plaisir d'exprimer ses regrets, d'être sincèrement désolé, mais secrètement ravi de les transmettre, de loin de confier ses bons voeux à des intermédiaires, d'empêcher l'équivoque de croître irrémédiablement. Quelle satisfaction de ne pas espérer que quelque chose arrive, mais de rester couché sur le canapé avec un livre, en espérant qu'il n'arrivera rien, d'entendre le bois craquer, de penser, c'est plaisant de rester sans avoir envie de partir. Quel, déni, quel délice de ne pas avoir à se préoccuper de son apparence, les cheveux défaits dans les draps frais, de boire à petite gorgée de l'eau minérale rafraîchie, de grignoter des crackers salés dans laissés sur l'assiette, de ne pas avoir à craindre de répercussions ou à éviter le fâcheux à qui vous cassez les pieds. Même le gardien est parti à la fête. S'il te manque quoi que ce soit, il te faudra aller le chercher seul. Le bleu de la chambre séduit. Les voitures des convives font retentir la chaussée mouillée. Tu cèdes à un moment de tristesse, Fronce à l'idée que tu ne manqueras à personne. Voilà ce que c'est. Tu as choisi de te retirer afin que, peut-être, tes pensées vivent. So happy you said casse le pied. That's one of my favorite French expressions. <laughs> that does not translate. Uh, je veux dédier ce poème à tout, à tout le monde qui a resté chez eux. Il n'est pas venu ici ce soir. Voilà, mais vous oubliez Patrick. Voilà. Du drame. Ok. Uh, dividend, dividend of the social opt-out. How lovely it is not to go, to suddenly take ill, not seriously ill, just a little under the weather, <laughs> to feel slightly peaked, indisposed, plagued by a vague ache or a slight inexplicable chill. Perhaps such pleasures are denied to those who never feel obliged, if there are such. How pleasant to convey your regrets, to feel sincerely sorry but secretly pleased, to send them on their way without you, to entrust your good wishes to others, to spare the equivocal its inevitable rise. How nice not to hope that something will happen, but to lie on the couch with a book hoping that nothing will, to hear the wood creak and to think. It is lovely to stay without wanting to leave. How delicious not to care how you look clean and uncombed in the sheets, to sip brisk mineral water, to take small bites off crisp saltines, to leave some on the plate, to fear no repercussions nor dodge the unkind person you bug. Even the caretaker has gone to the party. If you want something, you will have to get it yourself. The blue of the room seduces, The cars of the occupied sound the wet road. You indulge in a moment of sadness, make a frown at the notion you won't be missed. This is what it is. You have opted to be forgotten so that your thoughts might live. Thank you.